All right, welcome back to part two on the Tale of Genji. So we just finished up with the first chapter or selections from the first chapter of the, the Tale of Genji. Um, the, what was the chapter? Uh, the Polonia Accord, <laughs> Kiritsubo. Now we're going to move on to chapter nine. So yeah, I'm skipping eight chapters. Yeah, no, seven chapters, skipping seven chapters. Um, chapter nine is in many ways sort of like quintessential of the Genji as a whole, which is one of the reasons why I had you guys read it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the title. Well, first let's get our, back to our outline. All right. So the title of the, of chapter nine in Japanese is Aoi. Um, this is a, a reference both to Genji's wife. In fact, well, okay, so Genji's wife's name, or like what she's called in the text, she's called Aoi. Um, but this term Aoi is actually the name of a plant. Um, so Side and Sticker translates that as heart mine. Um, it's fine, I guess. Um, the, the Aoi plant is uh, similar to um, hollyhocks. So hollyhocks are these, um, they, they grow and they, they have stems that sort of grow upwards and then they have flowers that sort of grow all along the, like, the length of the stem. Um, that is translated as heart vine. And the reason why heart, the heart vine part is important here is because um, the, the leaves of the Aoi plant are heart shaped. And sort of that's why this um, plant's name is appended to this woman who's Genji's wife. So the two characters that we really need to focus on in this chapter are, again, women. Not Genji. Genji's kind of peripheral. I mean, he's sort of, again, he's the one about whom these other women circulate. So the first person that we want to focus on is Genji's wife, Aoi. Um, and secondly, we want to focus on, uh, oh, I totally forgot. What I should have begun this video with is actually a content warning. Um, and it's part of the reason why I separated out this video from the other one. So what I want to note is that in this uh, lecture, I'm going to be talking about sexual assault. Um, if that is a problem for you for any reason, you don't need to justify it in any way whatsoever. Um, just stop watching this video. You don't have to watch it. Like you were not assigned this video. Stop it. Um, if you feel like you need to let me know that, you know, you couldn't do this part. I mean, in fact, the assignment that you'll have to do for this week won't even necessarily refer to this. You can if you want. Um, but yeah, if that's a problem for you, please just exit out. Like, do what you need to do to be your best self because, you know, talking about sexual assault in a literary text is not more important than you as an individual. So before I move on, I just wanted to note that. Again, you don't need to justify yourself. Just close the video, go have a coffee, do whatever. Again, take care of yourselves. All right. So um, with that extremely important uh, message out of the way. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about Aoi, who is Genji's wife, and Orokujo, who is the, the other woman. She's the jealous woman. So I had noted earlier that there's this superficial similarity between, say, it's between Orokujo and Kokiden. But here in this chapter, we're going to sort of see what a Kokiden figure would look like if she were far more sympathetic. In other words... The Kokiden consort just seems to be kind of mean and jealous for reasons that have largely to do with like her, her own personal sense of her status, and really little else. Um, also, the power dynamic is extremely different because the Kokiden consort, as the wife of a crown prince, sorry, not the wife, the mother <laughs> of a crown prince, oof, that's, a, that's some psychodrama there, as the mother of a crown prince, has a far better status and more secure status at court than someone like um, Orokujo. And the important sort of background bit of information that you need to know about Orokujo is this. Before she even meets Genji, she, is act she was actually the wife of a former crown prince who died before ascending the throne. So she has this tangential relationship to the court, but because she's not actually a princess, she's not actually of the imperial line in any way, her status is actually on the decline. In other words, she, she had sort of risen from like a middle to high aristocratic status to very high aristocratic status as the wife of a, you know, a future emperor. But then that guy never actually becomes emperor. So her status is now actually below 
where she started off in the first place because she no longer has her own family to rely on support. And the only thing that keeps her like in the know, so to speak, is her her own ability to entice and be amongst like the best people of court. And so in this way, she forms a relationship with Genji. And this is alluded to in an earlier chapter. Um, she's an older woman, not, not older in the sense of like, you know, she's, she's not a cougar. She's probably in her twenties actually, but she is older than Genji. And that's the important part is that she's older than Genji. And as I noted, um, Kogiden is kind of a caricature. She's not, a terribly sympathetic maybe you guys sympathize with her more than i do but i don't find her all that sympathetic but the different the, the primary difference is that we're sort of told the reasons why kokiden is is bitter and resentful whereas in the text we actually get to see it happening to rokujo in other words we see the events that sort of lead to her resentment so if you turn to page 332 in your hymnals sorry stupid joke um, let's see, 332. So there's going to be this imperial procession and the Aoi and the other members of her household want to go see it. So they all get in their fancy carriages and they're going to go out to the, you know, to park their carriages along the route where the imperial procession is going to take place. So that way they can get the best view of our, of our pretty boy, Mr. Genji himself. So what's wrong with this? Nothing necessarily, except they end up kind of um, butting in on Rokujo's turf. So Rokujo, who was, oh, actually, I'll just read this. So they decide kind of at the last minute that they're going to go out, and it says, And so carriages were hastily and ostenta unostentatiously decked out, and the sun was already high when they set forth. So, you know, they got, a, they got, a, they got going late. The waysides were by now too crowded to admit the elegant Sanjo. Sanjo is the, the household where um, Aoi lives. Procession. Coming upon several fine carriages not attended by grooms and footmen, the Sanjo men commenced clearing the space. Two palm frond carriages remained, not new ones, obviously belonging to someone who did not wish to attract attention. So th there's an interesting euphemism here. This sort of someone who did not wish to attract attention. So we're going to find out later that the woman in these carriages is Rokujo. Um, but it's not just that she's trying not to attract attention. It's also that she is sort of like doing the best she can with the meager resources that she has. So again, being sort of like being a bit down and out. The curtains and sleeves and aprons to be glimpsed beneath them, some in the gay colors little girls wear, were in very good taste. So she's still a woman of refinement, despite her circumstances, still a woman of, you know, mean, still an elegant woman. The men in attendance sought to defend their places against the Sanjo invader. So the men that are attending Rokujo are like, hey, you know, buzz off, jerks. <laughs> we aren't the sort of people you push around. <laughs> there had been too much drink in both parties, and so they're all drunk. <laughs> like, ah, right, move on. And the drunken ones were not responsive to the efforts of their more mature and collected seniors to restrain them. The palm frond carriages were from the Rokujo house of the high priestess of Ise. <clears throat> this is, by the way, uh, Rokujo's daughter. The Rokujo lady had come quietly to see the procession, hoping that it might make her briefly forget her unhappiness. The men from Sanjo had recognized her, but preferred to make it seem otherwise. A little bit further down. Among the newcomers were some of Genji's men. They recognized and felt a little sorry for the Rokujo lady, but not wishing to become involved, they looked the other way. Presently, all the Sanjo carriages were in place. The Rokujo lady behind the lesser ones. Behind the lesser ones. So not not a not just it's not just that the the Sanjo pr like procession is like blocking her view. It's also like the the also rans of Aoi's household, like the, the, the unimportant people in Aoi's household are actually blocking her view. So it's, it's not just that someone else is blocking her view, it's also that the unimportant people are blocking her view. <clears throat> Quite aside from her natural distress at the insult, she was filled with the bitter chagrin that having refrained from display, she had been recognized. In other words, despite all of her efforts to try and like stay incognito, it didn't matter. <clears throat> the stools for her carriage shafts had been broken and the shafts propped up on the hubs of perfectly strange carriages, a most undignified sight. It was no good asking herself why she had come. She thought of going home without seeing the procession, but there was no room for her to pass. And then came word that the procession was approaching, and she must, after all, see the man who had caused her such unhappiness, that is Genji. 
How weak is the heart of a woman? Perhaps this was not the bamboo by the river Hinokuma. He passed without stopping his horse or looking her way, and the unhappiness was greater than if she had stayed at home. So she's miserable. Um, they had like actually damaged her carriages. Um, she's like, fine, I'm just going to go home. But then can't even do that because they're blocking her way to get out. And then, you know, at that moment, Genji comes by shining and resplendent to the prettiest of pretty boys on his horse. And he doesn't even look her way. So this pisses her off immensely. And we will see the um, not reasonable ramifications of her being. So Rokujo at the beginning of the chapter or earlier in the chapter, early in the chapter is set up as a sympathetic character, someone who's been slighted, someone who's been treated in a way that is highly inappropriate for someone of her status. And not just like, and it's not just about status, but also sort of abused. It's like, you know, no one gives a crap about her anymore. And not, not just like the, this random woman from this palace, which she may or may not know, but also the man who supposedly is her lover doesn't seem to give a crap about her anymore. And so that pisses her off and probably reasonably so. But her reaction is not, probably not reasonable. <laughs> so this leads us to sort of what is the second most important bit from this chapter, which is the spirit possession. And I note here that this sort of, this is a supernatural. And so again, we're drawing from these, these other like prose fiction threads. So this is a supernatural element that is sort of reminiscent of the kinds of things that we saw in the tale of the bamboo cutter. So at this time, Aoi is pregnant with Genji's kid. And the whole pregnancy has been just one hassle after another. And they're, you know, Aoi has been sick several times and they have to bring in like priests to recite suit. Like they're all, they're doing all sorts of Buddha magic, trying to, to make her better. And it gets to the point where they think she's finally better. But then this super bizarre thing happens. So while Aoi is in labor, so she's about to give birth. Actually, I'm going to start on um, <sighs> what is this? 3:35. Yeah. No. Oh my god! Like, there's so much to deal with here, and I bet I don't want this video to take too long. Anyway, so there are these malign spirits that are assaulting um, Aoi. This is a thing that they thought could happen at this time. This idea that sort of either alive or dead. Um, someone's spirit could like essentially attack you and make you sick and even cause you to die. So, and this is actually, and this has been prefigured in the text in chapter four and another famous chapter of the Genji that is just, I didn't have you guys read called Yugao in which a woman literally is, in fact, a lover of Genji's is attacked in this way. Um, it's not known who it was at the time, but given the similarity of that incident and this one, it's presumed that it was probably Urokujo that time as well. So there's this one, so they manage to, they pull in some, some psychic mediums and they get all of the, the evil spirits transferred over into them, except for one, this malign spirit that is referred to in this paragraph here. The malign spirit was more insistent and Aoi was in great distress. Unpleasant rumors reached the Rokujo lady to the effect that it might be her spirit or that of her father, the late minister. And Rokujo actually starts to wonder if that's a real possibility because she starts having to have dreams about this. It says later in the paragraph, there had been no release from the anger since the other lady, that is Aoi, had so insulted her. This is that incident earlier with the procession. Indeed behaved as if she did not exist. More than once, she had the same dream. And this is, the, this is why she starts to think that maybe she is responsible. In the beautifully appointed apartments of a lady who seemed to be a rival, she would push and shake the lady and flail at her blindly and savagely. It was too terrible. Sorry, I need to scratch my foot. <laughs> um, sometimes in a daze, she would ask herself if her soul had indeed gone wandering off. The world was not given to speaking well of people whose transgressions had been far slighter. She would be notorious. It was common enough for the spirits of the angry dead to linger in this world. She had thought them hateful. And it was her own lot to set a hateful example while she still lived. She must think no more about the man who had been so cruel to her. 
But so to think was, after all, to think. This is probably, I don't know, I really love this particular, this particular paragraph. It's kind of amazing. So it's this idea that it's not just getting into Rokujo's psychology, like her feelings of having been abandoned by Genji, insulted by Aoi, um, but also her sense that like, I have to stop doing this, like this, I'm going to get, like, I'm, th this is just going to screw me over, like I'll get a terrible reputation, people will think ill of me, and I'll lose even more status in society than I've already lost. But, and then this brilliant phrase, she mustn't think no more about the man who had been so cruel to her, but so to think was, after all, to think. So this obsessive, like, I have to forget about him, I have to forget about him, I have to forget about him, and sort of Murasaki recognizes that this too is a kind of obsession. In other words, Orokujo is saying in her head, I'm obsessed with this man, I have to stop thinking about him, I have to stop thinking about him. But that constant refrain of, I have to stop thinking about him, is itself a kind of obsession. And sort of that is the, the, the genius and sort of the really the literary brilliant. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put my cards on the table here. I think this, this bit here is actually brilliant. This entire scene with, that goes back and forth between Aoi's bedchamber and Urokujo's and sort of how the way in which, because it never, the, the text never comes out and says, Urokujo possessed Aoi, because that would be boring. As a work of literature, that would just be stupid. And that'd be dumb. <laughs> but what it does instead is it insinuates this through this sort of like, is it happening? Is it not happening? But at the same time, it's also talking about sort of like the psychological states of these two women. And again, it's focused on the women, even though it's about, Gen about Genji, it's focusing on the women, their condition, their thoughts, their feelings, and so forth, so forth and so forth. Um, do, 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 she was seized with labor pains. And the, okay, so this is the moment when the possession happens, but no one realizes it yet. It was still too early for Aoi to be delivered of her child. Her women were less than fully alert, and then suddenly she was seized with labor pains. More priests were put to more strenuous prayers. The malign spirit refused to move. The most eminent of exorcists found the stubbornness extraordinary and could not think what to do. Then, after renewed efforts at exorcism more intense than before, it commenced sobbings as if in pain. Stop for a moment, please. I want to speak to General Genji. And it's interesting that she refers to him as General Genji because that was the designation he had when he was um, parading in that procession before. He was General Genji then, and he's General Genji now. So I want to talk to that man on his high horse who felt the need to ignore me. It was as they had thought. The women showed Genji to a place at Aoi's curtains, thinking, for she did not seem on the point of death, that Aoi had last words for Genji. For she did seem on the point of death, sorry. <clears throat> so he goes there thinking like, okay, this is her final moments. I need to be there to hear what she has to say. Her parents withdrew. The effect was grandly solemn as priests read from the Lotus Sutra in hushed voices, again, doing their Buddha magic. Genji drew the curtains back and looked down at his wife. She was heavy with child and very beautiful. Even a man who was nothing to her would have been saddened to look at her. Long, heavy hair bound at one side was set off by white robes, and he thought her lovelier than when she was most carefully dressed and groomed. This is allusion to another sort of doubling thing, but I didn't want to overload you guys with readings and with figures, but be aware that there's another sort of doubling that's taking place here. He took her hand. How awful. How awful for you. He could say no more. Usually so haughty and forbidding, she now gazed up at him with languid eyes that were presently filled with tears. How could he fail to be moved? This violent weeping, he thought, would be for her parents, soon to be left behind him, perhaps, at this last leave take. So he thinks this is Aoi reacting to Aoi's situation, when in reality, it's Rokujo reacting to being with Genji in this moment. You mustn't fret. It can't be as, so this is Genji talking in. It can't be as bad as you think. And even if the worst comes, we will meet again. And your good mother and father, the bond between parents and children, again, this karmic bond, lasts through many lives. You must tell yourself that you will see them again. Again, it's, it's considered to be a good thing. Like, no, karma's bad. Can someone write it? Can someone like send a note, send a messenger to Genji and say karma bad, <laughs> not karma good? And then, no, no, I was hurting so. I asked them to stop. So this is Rokujo talking. I was hurt. So she was hurting because, listen, you know, the exorcists are pushing her out of Aoi's body. I had not dreamed that I would come to you like this. It is true. A troubled soul will sometimes go wandering off. The voice was gentle and affectionate. And this is Rokujo composing a poem 
in Aoi's voice, essentially. Bind the hem of my robe to keep it within the grieving soul that has wandered through the skies. It was not Aoi's voice, nor was the manner hers. Extraordinary, and then he knew that it was the voice of the Rokjo lady. He was aghast. He had dismissed the talk as vulgar and ignorant fabrication, and here before his eyes he had proof that such things did actually happen. He was horrified and repelled. You may say so, but I don't know who you are. Identify yourself. It was indeed she. Aghast. Was there no stronger word? He waved the women back. Thinking that these calmer tones meant a respite from pain, her mother came with medicine, and even as she drank it down, she gave birth to a baby boy. So in that moment, it's like almost Rokujo has replaced her. Aoi gives birth to the son Yugiri, and so this is Rokujo's attempt to in many ways sort of supplant Aoi in like the moment that sort of defi- I mean, we're talking about a patriarchal society, so bear with me here. In the moment that sort of that defines a woman as a wife in a patriarchal society, sort of giving birth to a child. Um, she is trying to take her over, but also this is the result of Urokujo's like own intense desires for Genji and her feelings of abandonment. But because of that scene earlier with the um, with the dream, it's kind of an open question whether or not Urokujo even understands what she is doing as she's doing it. It is clear. So Uro, I mean, Urokujo actually lives for several more chapters. Um, it is clear later in the text that she knows what happened, what happened, and she repents actually for what she's done. But at this moment, it's not clear. And so Aoi gives birth to this child. And again, so Aoi gives birth. Um, Aoi dies kind of all of a sudden too. Just <laughs> she gets sick again after giving birth and then dies. But it's interesting that the focus shortly after Yugiri's birth, so the son of Genji and Aoi, after his birth, the focus then returns to Rokujo. The Rokujo lady received the news with mixed feelings. She had heard that her rival was critically ill, and now the crisis had passed. She was not herself. I love that phrase. Like, she was not herself. And in many ways, sort of think about that as a kind of, like, emblematic for the entire text. She was not herself. Like, Fujitsubo is in many ways not herself. She's sort of a stand-in for Kiritsubo, even though she's a different woman. Murasaki is not herself. The Rokujo lady is not herself because, quite literally, she was now, just now, Aoi, in Aoi's body. The strangest thing was that her robes were permeated with the scent of the poppy seeds burned at exorcisms because, in a sense, she was there when she was being exorcised. She changed clothes repeatedly and even washed her hair, but the odor persisted. She was overcome with self-loathing. And what would others be thinking? It was a matter she could discuss with no one. She could only suffer in distraught silence. So unlike the, the Kukiden consort who, like, really, it'd be kind of hard to sympathize with the Kukiden consort. Here we see, like, the, there's so much focus on Urokujo, her suffering and her pain and her, but also what we have to bear in mind is that, like, her, her obsession, her desire, and her, her suffering as a result of those things kill someone murders someone like you can't just overlook that fact the text kind of glosses over this fact but and in many ways the text even kind of lets her off the hook because Aoi sort of dies after suddenly getting ill after all this happens so even if like what Urokujo has done is not a direct cause of Aoi's death it certainly contributed to it so she at least bears some responsibility for this woman's death while at the same time, the text also wants you to see it from this other side. Like, she's not a perfectly vindictive woman. There are reasons why these things happened. And like, if Gen, and in fact, really, in many ways, you can look at it as like, even though Rokujo is sort of like more immediately culpable, the person who bears ultimate culpability for all of these events, for Aoi's suffering, for Rokujo's suffering, and for the things that happen as the result of what happens between these two women, really the person responsible is Genji. And the person who will bear absolutely none of the consequences for, for any of this is Genji. It's the women who will bear the consequences. And again, so there's that focus on the women, their condition, and what happens to them. So I don't know, like... You may disagree with me, but I think the argument for why the text is really about the women in the book 
I don't know. I think it's a pretty strong one. And it's for the, these sorts of reasons where like the, the, you know, the, the best passages, the most interesting literature in this text is always when it's talking about women. <clears throat> and so um, the last of these interesting passages, I'm probably the most difficult to talk about. So again, I, I want to reiterate the the if you sort of stuck around um, even after my first content warning, I want to reiterate like I will be talking about um, sexual assault of a character in this text. Um, if that is a problem for you, like I appreciate that you stuck around up until now, but please, please take care of yourself. Like be aware of your own limits and just turn the video off. I will not judge you for it. All right. So with that in mind. I want to talk about the end of this chapter because so it's on a superficial level, the end of the Aoi chapter might seem kind of odd because after Aoi dies, suddenly it turns back to Genji and Murasaki. So why is this? Why would we get this bit that feels kind of tacked on at the end where Genji consummates in giant fucking scare quotes consummates his relationship with Urasaki so they have sex for the first time sex everything needs to be in scare quotes here and I like I said this is this is gonna be kind of difficult to talk about accurately um well it goes back to what I was saying before in many ways the theme of this chapter are sort of the negative consequences of Genji's obliviousness being visited upon the women who are closest to him and so if you think about it at this time who are the three women who have the most intimate relationships with Genji well they're his wife Aoi who dies as a result of his fecklessness um, this um, older woman, Urokujo, who is insulted, her like everything about her life is become, like, is put into question. Um, she's ignored by the man who is supposedly in love with her. And as a result, she does this terrible thing to Aoi. And then the other woman who figures prominently in woman, not even really woman. I mean, Murasaki is probably thirteen at the time that this happens. If I'm right, it's like thirteen or fifteen. I can't remember exactly what her age is at this point. Um, she's very young. She's basically like, this is like, you know, someone who, you know, in our terms would be in like junior high or high school, like, you know, a very young adolescent. Um, and Genji rapes her. There, I said it. In fact, I, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with that. In the past, I've always been kind of, I don't really know how to talk about this bit in the text. Okay, so let's look at it from two perspectives. So from our perspective, from by modern standards, <clears throat> what Genji does in sort of slipping into Murasaki's room and having and basically sexually assault, I mean, it has all the hallmarks of a sexual assault. Like Murasaki does not want this to happen. Like, so th they're right there. That makes it rape. By our standards, that's all you really need. Um, however, it's kind of kind of a question whether or not it would be considered that egregious by the standards of the time because to be perfectly honest even like ordinary romantic encounters at that time would be rape by our standards pretty much um, a common pattern that we see throughout the text is essentially like genji sneaking into a woman's room and then more or less embarrassing her into having sex with him Sounds pretty rapey to me. So that's what I mean by whether or not the standards of the time would consider that to be to rise to the level of what we would call sexual assault. Because again, we're talking about different like social mores, even if like we've considered them abhorrent, they are different. However, that having been said, it's fairly clear in the text that what happens between Genji and Murasaki, there's something wrong about it. There's something that is just not kosher and you know that from two things one Murasaki's reaction so let so if this was you know if they if this was a perfect romance and everything were you know the way it's supposed to be and so all right 
and it's kind of even, oh man, it sort of, it happens almost nonchalantly. So like this has a lot to do with the fact that like the sexual act itself in the Heian period was considered to be kind of gross and, and unseemly. So you're never going to get it like an actual description of a sexual encounter. You're only really going to get sort of all the events that lead up to and follow thereafter. So he says to her, you've grown, he said, lifting a low curtain back over its frame. She looks shyly aside. Her hair and profile, so there's the sort of romantic intro bit. Her hair and profile seemed in the lamplight even more like those of the lady he so longed for, which is Fujitsubo. In this moment, he's thinking about Fujitsubo as he's about to have sex with Murasaki. He had worried about her, he said, coming near. I would like to tell you everything, but it is not a very lucky sort of story. So he wants to tell her about what happened with Aoi and the whole situation. Um, again, like there's no mention here of what happens. And it says Genji returned to his room asking Chujo to massage his legs. He lay down to rest. The next morning he sent off a note for his baby son. He gazed on and on at the answer from one of the women and all the sadness came back. It was a tedious time. So uh where okay murasaki was on his mind she was clever and she had many delicate ways of pleasing him in the most trivial diversions he had not seriously thought of her as a wife now he could not restrain himself it would be a shock of course what had happened her women had no idea of knowing when the line had been crossed one morning genji was up early and murasaki stayed on and on in bed so here we see the first sign that there's something wrong here it was not at all like her to sleep so late. Might she be unwell? As he left for his own rooms, Genji pushed an inkstone inside. So he's thinking of this as like a standard romantic encounter. It's like, oh, we had sex every night. Now we're going to do the elegant thing of exchanging poems with each other because that's what lovers do, you know, after their first night with each other. That's not quite how Murasaki reacts. She had not dreamed he had anything of, the, of this sort in his mind. What a fool she had been to repose her whole confidence in so gross and unscrupulous a man. It was almost noon when Genji returned. They say you're not feeling well. What could be the trouble? I was hoping for a game of Go. Like, listen to how callous he sounds. What could possibly be the matter? I was hoping we could play a game. After I sexually assaulted you. She pulled the covers over her head. Her women discreetly withdrew. He came up beside her. What a way to behave. What a very unpleasant way to behave. Try to imagine, please, what these women are thinking. Like, uh, you're making such a spectacle of yourself. What is wrong with you? He drew back the covers. She was bathed in perspiration, and the hair at her forehead was matted from weeping. So she is just drenched in tears. Absolutely covered head to toe. Like, Basically, this woman probably like had a panic attack, what we would consider to be a panic attack after having been sexually assaulted by this man who had been taking care of her for the past couple of years. Dear me, this does not augur well at all. He tried in every way he could to think of to comfort her, but she seemed genuinely upset and did not offer so much as a word in reply. So I think... Um, Murasaki is pretty clear that what has happened here is there's it's wrong like that that, sh that there's something fundamentally wrong that has happened here um, and I mean but it's also been wrong for a while like the whole situation like Genji bringing Murasaki who is a fairly lowborn woman into his own household where he then essentially raises her to be his lover to be his like ideal wife like that's messed up that's fucked up it's also i mean from a literary perspective we do have to remember that the sort of raising of murasaki is in many ways analogous to the the weird situation between himself and genji sorry between genji and fujitsubo so Fujitsubo, like the older woman who is in many ways a proxy for his mother, now sort of the situation has been reversed. You know, Genji is the, the older man who is essentially a proxy for Murasaki's father. Like, 
in many ways, he's simply reproducing the kind of messed up psychosexual like situation that he was raised in in the first place. But that doesn't make it any more messed um, really than it should be. So I, I hate to end on that particular note, but that's actually where the chapter ends. And I want you to bear that in mind because we're, we're going to be revisiting this subject again, this question of like, how do women see these sexual relationships and how they're treated in a text that we will, we will um, look at later. But for now, um, I hope you guys are all uh, staying caught up on your readings and your assignments. Um, as I said, what I discussed at the end of this particular video won't necessarily be required for this week's assignment, so don't feel bad if you had to bow out. Um, again, it's perfectly fine to take care of yourselves. Um, next week, we will be talking about the, the Tosa Niki and one of my faves from the, the Heian period, um, Seishonagon and her pillow book, The Snarkiest Lady, Whoever Lived. Um, not to whoever lived, but she's pretty snarky. Um, but until then, um, do well. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Stop by um, my office hours on Zoom on Wednesday. Uh, but I guess until next week. Bye.